thing of worship. Grab your Bible. If you don't have your Bible, yada. Turn to the book of Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 13, I'll be reading verses 1 through 6. This morning, I want to talk to you about the consolation of contentment. If we listen to all of our worship this morning, we've learned that God is good. We learn that he's always loving us. He's always providing for us. He's always protecting us. He supplies our every need. And we should be contented. Amen? The Gallup World Poll was recently taken. And it had a contentment quotient. That they tested. They polled people from a scale of 1 to 10 and asked them how contented they were with their daily life. On a scale of 1 to 10, only 3.5% of people are contented, are happy. There's numerous factors that play into that political unrest, economic instability moral decay in our society. But society is flooded more than ever before now with goods, with gizmos and gadgets. And they're all designed to make us happy, yet we're not happy. We're not content with what we have. We're not content with what's going on in the world. We always want something different. We always want a little bit more of something, thinking that it's going to make us happy. In 1976, your typical supermarket was stocked with 9,000 items. Today, Walmart stocks 142,000 items, worth $43 million. Yet, we're still not happy. I ask you this morning, of all of those items at Walmart, Of 142,000 items, how many of those items do you think are absolutely essential? And how many of those items do you think are absolutely inconsequential? Yet, we look to things to make us happy. There was a 5th century man named Arrhenius. Who lived in Egypt. He determined that he was going to live a simple life. That he was going to abandon all the trappings of things and of society. So he moved out in the desert and he was determined to live a life of poverty. But every now and then he would come in and he would visit the city of Alexandria. And when he would come into Alexandria, he would stand on a street corner. And watch all the vendors. In those days, we didn't have stores like we're used to today. The vendors would be in carts out on either sides of the street. And Arrhenius would go into Alexandria, and he was known to stand and watch for a whole day at a time and just stand in the same position. Finally, a man noticed that he was continually doing this, and he went to Arrhenius, and he said, what are you doing? I mean, I see you here, you come here numerous days, but you just stand there. You're not buying anything, you're not trying on any clothes, you're not visiting the carts. Why are you here? And Arrhenius said, it does my heart good just to stand here and see all the things I don't need. There was a devout Quaker that had a new neighbor that was moving in next door to him. So he stood outside and rested on his fence, and he watched as the neighbor began to back up the moving van. Then he began to unload and unload and unload and furniture and electronics and appliances and pictures and carpet and rugs, and all day long this went on, and once he had unloaded the truck, he left, and he came back with another truckload, and he's unloading more and more and more stuff. And finally, the Quaker neighbor yelled over at him and said, hey, Joe, if you find you're missing anything, 
let me know and I'll let you know how to live without it. You see, the sad fact is, as Americans, we have more than ever before. As Christians, we have more than we've ever had in our lives. As Christians, today, we can worship freely. Today, we're not under attack. Today, where we are in our nation, we are peaceful. In Ukraine, people are suffering. Their lives are being devastated and torn apart. And I believe that if you ask them today, and you could go to the Ukraine and visit with those people, they would tell you, we would be happy just to have peace, just to have contentment. We have more than ever before, and we're more discontent than we ever have been. The Apostle Paul said in Philippians 4, I have learned. Now, I want you to underline that. It didn't say it's part of my God-given nature. He didn't say they taught this to me at school or that it came to me in a great flowing vision. What he said is, I have learned. Because you see, contentment is a process. I have learned in whatsoever state I am therein to be content. I ask you this morning, have you learned through your life, through all the trials and tribulations, through all the wants, through all the needs, through all the times that you did have, through the times that you didn't have, have you learned to be content. Because this morning we're going to look at a passage of Scripture that's going to tell you and I contentment is not optional. You see, as sons and daughters of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, we are expected to be content. We're expected to be happy. 1 Timothy chapter 6 says, Having food and raiment, let us be therein content. And in my life, there's a little axiom I've learned. It seems to me that those who never have enough are the ones who never give enough. You see, the world tells us, get all you can. Take all that you can take. And keep all that you make. But God's word tells me his children are not beggars. Mature Christians are masterful givers. They understand God's recipe for success. And listen, his recipe for success is never what we get. It's always what we give. And his word tells us clearly that we receive in direct proportion to what we give. Now listen, there's a heavy message in that. If you don't have enough in your life, I suggest you look at your giving. Because my Bible tells me, and the Word of God is infallible, to him that giveth much, he receiveth much. God's children are not beggars. We need to understand his recipe. 2 Corinthians chapter 9 says, He which soweth sparingly shall reap sparingly. 2 Corinthians 9, 7 says, God loves a cheerful giver. Acts chapter 20 and verse 35 says, It's more blessed to give than it is to receive. Luke chapter 6 verse 38 says, Give and it shall be given unto you. That's abundance. That's assurance. That's expectance. And the result of guarding God's word in our life and giving according to God's word brings the consolation of contentment. The economist Vance Lowry once said, show me someone who's always needy and I'll show you someone that's usually greedy. You see, the key to contentment 
is found in receiving God's treasures, sharing God's measures, and enjoying God's pleasures. So this morning, I want to share with you some keys from God's Word about the consolation of contentment. That God's Word makes very, very clear to you and I, we can be contented no matter what circumstance we're in, no matter what the situations are, no matter how deep the hurt, no matter how heavy the pain, we can be contented. First of all, I want you to notice in this passage of Scripture, the command of contentment. Contentment is a command. In verse 5, Let your conversation be without covetousness and be content. He didn't say, I suggest that you be content. Would you please think about being content? Maybe if if you have these things, you might be content. No. He says, be content with such things as you have. This text is rooted in love. In verse 1 it says, let brotherly love continue. There's two commands for contentment that I find in verse 5. First of all, there's a command of our conversation. Verse 5, let your conversation be without covetousness. To covet is to crave. It's to be consumed with desire. And have you ever noticed how our speech reveals our heart? When I was thinking about this message, I thought we can have two kinds of heart. We can have a Jesus heart or we can have a Judas heart. You know, in the Bible, we learned about Judas who betrayed Jesus for covetousness. He betrayed Jesus for 30 pieces of silver. Remember the story of the Last Supper that we're given in John chapter 13. and verse 2, it says, And supper being ended, listen to me, the devil having now put into the heart of Judas. Now pay attention. Before Judas ever spoke, it entered his heart. Out of the heart comes our true feelings. Out of the heart is expressed our true emotions. The problem is not so much our mouth as it is our heart. And Judas betrayed Jesus because he wasn't content with what he had. Because he was greedy. Notice where Satan always plants corruption, conspiracy, and covetousness. It's in the heart. And corruption is conceived there. And then in the heart, it's confirmed there, and it comes out of the mouth. Listen to the conversation of Judas in Matthew chapter 26. Then one of the twelve called Judas went unto the chief priest and said unto them, What will you give me, and I'll deliver him unto you? And they covenanted with him for 30 pieces of silver. And from that time, he sought the opportunity to betray him. This morning, I want you to know, a Judas heart is a heart of betrayal. But a Jesus heart is a heart of beauty. A Jesus heart always talks about Jesus. A Jesus heart extols Jesus. Somebody with a Jesus heart is filled with grace and gentleness and goodness and gratitude and generosity and glory and guidance and gain. And it's always about his greatness. Luke chapter 8. But that on the good ground are they which in an honest and good heart, having heard the word, keep it. Keep it. And bring forth fruit. But on the other hand, a Judas heart is concerned with greed, grievances, griping, always groaning, full of gloom and doom and grudges. 
And they're always looking for their own gain and their own governance and their own control, their own greatness. And it's not about his glory. It's about their own. I hate to have to say this this morning, but it's true. Our churches are full of Judah's hearts. Our communities embrace a Judah's heart. Our schools enable it. Our government entices it. The new world order wants to establish it. And in Matthew chapter 12, Jesus said, O generation of vipers, how can ye being evil speak good things? For out of the, listen, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. Jesus shows compassion and consideration, but Judas and a Judas heart is always about currency and control. Did you know most of the problems that ever take place in a church have to do with currency and control? People want control of the money. They want to say about what's going to be done with the money. And if they don't get their way, they're going to not worship at you. They're going to not extol Jesus Christ to get to you. It's about currency and control. I need to say something to you this morning. We need to understand something. The church is not a democracy. It was never meant to be a democracy. The church is a theocracy. A theocracy, it belongs to the Lord God Almighty. And he administers his church through his son, Jesus Christ, who sends the Holy Spirit to call leadership and calls people to follow the leadership. It's a follow the leader deal. Amen? The church is not a democracy, and we've made a great error. We've allowed the world to infiltrate the church and tell us we need their structure. And here's what happens. When we let their structure come in, and it's not God's structure, they become entitled. They think, I have a right. I have a right to be seen and heard. I have a right to direct what ought to be done. I have a right to control this. It's a control issue. And listen to me this morning. I promise you, you will never find Robert's Rules of Order in the Bible. I want you to show it to me. If you think it's there, come bring me God's Word. Crack it open and show it to me. Yet we allow Robert's Rules of Order to guide our structure in the church. You'll never find a government-sanctioned 501c3 corporation in the New Testament. It is not there. You will never find Paul calling the church to order and saying, now let's vote about whether I go to Thessalonica next week and whether we send an offering to our brothers that are in need. It's not there. The church is not a democracy. And here's one I really love. Committees. Oh, Lord. You know, I'm reminded of Ronald Reagan. He said a lot of good things. But one thing he said one time is, I remember hearing him say, what ought to scare us the most, what ought to just shake us to the core, is someone that shows up and says, I'm from the government, and I'm here to help you. <laughs> that ought to scare us to death. Amen? Amen. We don't need more committees. Our problem with our government in this nation is we have too many committees that are doing nothing but enriching themselves at your and my expense. Committees are where things go to die. And we all know that, yet it amazes me in the church that people want more committees. We need to not corrupt ourselves with conversation that's covetous. Don't waste your breath on carnality and controversy and corruption and least of all on control. Proverbs chapter 15 says, a soft answer 
turneth away wrath. Proverbs 15, 4 says, A wholesome tongue is a tree of life. Proverbs 16, 24, Pleasant words are as honeycomb. They're sweet to the soul. They're health to the bones. Our words are worthy. Our conversation is crucial. Our speech is serious. And contentment is a command. Not only is there the command of our conversation, but there's the command of consideration. In verse 5, it says, be content with the things that you have. Now, let me tell you what that means. It means, be content. Be content. Be content. That's what it means. Be satisfied. Be gratified. Be edified with what we have. And be content. Be hopeful. Be peaceful. Be restful. We live in a world that's driving us daily into discontentment, disharmony, disillusionment. And it's because they've taught us that enough is never enough. And I've learned in my life, and I bet if you'd be honest, you'd learn the same thing in yours. My problem is not my wants. My problem is my needs. And once my needs are fulfilled, I need to let go of my wants. We want a new job. We want a new house. We want a new car. Some people want a new spouse. Amen? The Dalai Lama was once asked, what surprises you the most about humanity? And he replied, man sacrifices his health for money and then sacrifices his money to get back his health. Then he said, people are anxious about their future. They agonize about their present. And the result is, They squander both. And then he said, man lives like he's never going to die. And then he dies, never having really lived. Listen, loved ones, be content. Be content with his love. Be content with his leadership. Be content with his lordship. And in Philippians 4.19, it says, my God shall supply all of your need according to his riches by Christ Jesus. Benjamin Franklin once said, contentment makes poor men rich and discontentment makes rich men poor. So this morning we have the command of commitment. But second of all, I want you to notice the commitment of contentment. Verse 5. For he has said, I will never leave thee, nor forsake thee. That's a commitment. That's a commitment to my contentment, amen? And as long as I know that my Lord is with me, as long as I know my Lord will never leave me, he'll never forsake me, he knows just what I need, he's an on-time God then I can be contented. I can be happy, joyous, and free. God's commitment to us seals our commitment to him. In verse 5, it's an absolute promise. I want you to notice that what he said in verse 5 is not conditioned by politics or precedent. Proceedings, pestilence, priorities. It doesn't depend on the government or COVID-19 or the World Health Organization, the United Nations, the President, the Congress, and it doesn't depend on a committee. Amen? He said it's an absolute assurance that I will never leave you and I will never forsake you. That's a commitment to contentment. God issued his assurances throughout the ages from the book of Genesis to the book of Revelation. 
I remember when he made the promise to Jacob in Genesis chapter 28. And he said to Jacob, behold, I am with thee. He made a promise to Israel in Deuteronomy 31. Be strong and of good courage. Fear not. Don't be afraid of them. For the Lord thy God, it is he that doth go with thee. He made a promise to Joshua. Joshua chapter 1 and verse 5. There shall not any man be able to stand before thee all the days of thy life. As I was with Moses, so I shall be with thee. There's a promise to Solomon. 1 Chronicles chapter 28. And David said to Solomon his son, Be strong and of good courage, and do it. Fear not, nor be dismayed. For the Lord God, even my God, will be with thee. I want you to know that while life is uncertain, my God is always certain. Psalms 138 says, Thou hast magnified thy word above thy name. Psalm 119 verse 89, Forever, O Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. And what is his word to you and me? I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. That's a commitment to my contentment. I remember Peter on the Sea of Galilee when he was bid to walk out on the water. And he took his eyes off Jesus and began to sink. And loved ones, listen to me. God never leaves us. We leave him. We take our eyes off him. We get our eyes, and the world is a master at wanting to control our eyes. They want us to look at fear. They want us to look at frustration and damnation. They are doing everything they can do to keep our vision off of Jesus. But God's commitment has been tried by God's promise. In Numbers chapter 23, it said, God is not a man that he should lie. Neither the son of man that he should repent. Hath he said, and shall he not do it? Or hath he spoken, and shall he not make it good? God's commitment is tried by God's promise, but God's commitment is trusted by God's presence. We have his inherent presence. Matthew chapter 28 says, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. But then we have his internal presence. In John chapter 14, it says, Even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him, but ye know him, for he dwelleth where? In you. And shall be in you. And he says, I will never deny you. I will never desert you. I will never abort you. I will never abandon you. And never means never. Not temporarily and not eternally. I will not lead you down. I will not let you down. And I'll never leave you down. That's content. That's a commitment to contentment. If you're sick this morning, I can tell you my God will never leave you. If you're suffering, he'll never leave you. If you're eat up with shame, he'll never leave you. If you're afraid, he'll never forsake you. If you're afflicted, he's always with you. In times of triumph and in times of trouble, you can lean on him, learn from him, and look to him. Remember the example in God's word of Stephen when he was being stoned. What a horrific way to die. What a terrible circumstance that he found himself in. But in Acts chapter 7, it says, But he, being filled with the Holy Ghost, looked up steadfastly into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing on the right hand of God. And said, Behold, I see the heavens open, and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. Let me ask you this morning, 
when you're going through your trials and tribulations and troubles, turn your eyes upon Jesus. See the glory of the heavens opened. See the Savior standing right by the throne of Almighty God. And know that he's given you an eternal and a supernal promise. I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. So this morning we've looked at the command of contentment. We've seen God's commitment to contentment. And now let's look at the confidence of contentment. Verse 6. So that we may boldly say, The Lord is my helper. Listen to me this morning. Our confidence does not reside in our education or our emancipation. It's not present in our abilities and our abnormalities. It's not led by influence or affluence. Our confidence is in His credibility. Psalm 118 verse 6 says, So that we may boldly say, The Lord is my helper. I will not fear what man shall do unto me. Misplaced confidence is confidence that's misinformed. It's misguided. It's misaligned. It's misconstrued. And confidence in politicians is suicide. Confidence in drugs is biocide. Confidence in ecology is ecocide. Confidence in our family is fratricide. Too much confidence in our doctor is metacide. Confidence in humanity is genocide. Confidence in the government is vermicide. Amen? The rats. Confidence in virology is viricide. If you have confidence in CNN, that's verbicide. But confidence in Jesus is glorified gratified, and satisfied. Verse 6 says, Because of this, being of good courage, we say, The Lord is my helper. That's my confidence for contentment. True contentment will never be found in our fame, in our fortune, and in our power and prestige, in our loyalty or our royalty, but our contentment only resides in Jesus Christ. It's his salvation, his sanctification, and his sufficiency. And I'm content. I am content in knowing he's my savior. He's my source. He's my safety. He's my security. And he gives me an eternal commitment for all of my temporal consequences. Songwriter Nicole Nordman wrote, You're my strength when I'm weak. You're the treasure that I seek. You're my all in all. Seeking you as a precious jewel, Lord, to give up, I'd be a fool. You are my all in all. Taking my sin, my cross, my shame, rising again, I bless your name. You're my all in all. When I fall down, you pick me up. When I'm dry, you fill my cup. You are my all in all. So let me ask you this morning. Are you living in the consolation of contentment? Are you happy where you are? Are you at peace in knowing that Jesus Christ is our commander? He's given us his contentment with his commitment and confidence. And if we grasp those things, we live in the consolation of contentment. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, And he said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee. My strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I glory in my infirmities 
that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, in reproaches, infirmities, necessities, persecutions, distresses, for Christ's sake, when I'm weak, he is strong. So this morning, to live under his command, you must make a commitment. And you must have confidence in his assurance that he is all you need in your life. First John 2 and verse 28 says, Abide in him. Ephesians 3.12 says, We have boldness and access with confidence by the faith of Him, not them. And if you don't know Him, and you don't have a relationship with Him, you're missing the consolation of His contentment. Let's stand together. Heavenly Father, thank you again for your love your grace and your goodness. Thank you that you're all we need, Father. But please remind us when we get selfish, when we get lost, when we're hurting, Father, you're all we need. Give us that consolation of your contentment in our lives. Lord, if there's someone here that you've spoken to, may your perfect will be done. We ask it in Jesus' name.